How are you? We'll wait for some other people to go here. I couldn't, when I was looking to say like I was coming on, um, I couldn't find the live stream. It was kind of weird. I don't know, YouTube doing its thing again, I guess. It wasn't on like the homepage. It was on um, like the other live portion of the um, channel. Anyways, I have a few questions that you guys have pre-asked, so I'll answer those while you can think of other ones that you want answered. I'm not expecting a ton of people to come on here, but I did think it was kind of like a nice um, Christmas gift idea to you guys from me because I'm able to answer your questions. And that's always a nice Christmas gift, is it not? Is it not? And then what we can do is, oh no, I can't get to that. Okay, I gotta go through studio to get to those questions. iPads have like limited capacity for what they allow you to see. It's the weirdest thing for sometimes. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, da, da, da. I hope you guys are staying warm if you're in Canada or I guess the US. The US is supposed to be equally as cold, which is absolutely insane because it is very cold, like very, very, very cold. YouTube does this thing where it gets rid of all my responded to comments and then I never see them again. Found them. Okay. So first question is from Justin. He's asking if fluoride in the water, um, the fluoride in the water I use on my plants cause brown and crunchy leaf tips and spots. If so, what can I do about it? So the salt content in water, it has to be pretty. So I guess it depends on what kind of plant we're talking about. If we're just talking about like a run of a mill tropical plant or um, garden plant, lettuce, that sort of thing. No, I wouldn't lean towards it being the fluoride, chloride, or chloramine causing that kind of brown tip. What I will say though, is that the, um, the salt inside of water can build up in the potting soil over time. So you have to keep in mind that salt isn't just sodium. There are different forms of salt. And so because of that, you need to be mindful of whether or not you're flushing your pots. So the times when people won't flush pots is typically when they have, um, I should make sure my audio is working. You guys will tell me if it's not right. Comment down below if my audio is okay. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. So many Merry Christmases. Cordovia, Alaska. Cordovia, Alaska, is it cold there? That's a real question. Sounds good, okay. Just wanted to make sure. I'm using my wireless mic, so it's like, it's a different, it's it's a new kind of mic than what I usually use. So um, when it comes to fluoride, I would actually flush your pot if you're concerned with that. Now, with that being said, the tips of leaves or the outer areas of leaves, the reason why they usually turn brown is lack of ambient humidity. So ambient humidity um, does a few things, but one of those things is it reduces water loss from the plant. And if the leaf or the plant is losing too much water too quickly, and it's unable to support the entire biomass of that plant, um, what ends up happening is we lose something called turgor pressure when we lose turgor pressure or we hit even worst case scenario permanent wilting point areas of the plant leaves begin to collapse and die off which ultimately turns into brown um, leaf areas. So I would explore two things. I would explore humidity which I have a video coming out on that. I'm okay so I'm kind of nervous to post uh, my regular posting schedule which for the winter time, you guys, I'm gonna be posting on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. The Friday content is gonna be houseplant content. The Tuesday content is gonna be kind of a wild card depending on what you guys are vibing with and what you're asking me the most in the comment section that week. And the Sunday one's gonna be like a gardening one. Obviously it's winter outside, so it's gonna be like gardening theory or something to that um, effect or indoor gardening is what it will be. So. I'm going to start doing that and on the first of every month I'm also going to um, starting in January 
is I'm going to release a video on what you need to start indoors for your gardens. So this will include ornamentals as well as produce plants. So um, that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, those are the two things I would watch out for there, Justin. Um, let me know uh, how you, I mean, I would look at humidity first and foremost before I would look at fluoride. In especially if the soil is not very old. If the soil is not old, then I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't immediately jump to the thought that it's some sort of like a fluoride or chlorine or um, chloramine issue there. So that's something to, to look at. So Madeline is asking, what's the best way to revive potting soil? Do I add compost or release fertilizer to make it useful again? Um, and is there time that I shouldn't reuse it? I use reuse potting soil for some plants and I've forgotten all the time and don't fully know what I'm doing. So I have a very old video on this. I should maybe do an updated video on this, but there's a number of different things you could do. So one of which is adding the compost. Now I would watch my compost video specifically for this, you guys. So I would not add compost that is not cured. So do um, a test, like a germination test inside of that compost first. So do 10 pea seeds. This is houseplant people, uh, gardeners, you name it. Do 10 pea seeds. If eight or less, if less than eight of them germinate, then there's a possibility that that compost is not cured. So do not use that in your potting soil. If you choose to do this, I would go anywhere from, I'd say 25%. Some people will say 50. 50, I think is a little bit high for uh, compost. You end up with really rapid green growth, yes, but rapid green growth doesn't, it's not necessarily a good thing. So when we have too much nitrogen, we imbalance phosphorus, potassium, and a number of other micronutrients. And that micronutrients can't complete, compete with nitrogen. So nitrogen is the main uh, nutrient that gets uptaken, which causes other nutrient deficiencies that can cause blossom end rot and a whole bunch of other issues. So I like to keep it balanced. I would do 25% if we're talking about reviving a potting soil. And then what you wanna take into consideration is adding lime. Um, this is just garden lime. It's very inexpensive. It's chalk lime, what they use on football fields and soccer fields. So if you don't wanna pay uh, big bucks for like the minute garden packages, just go buy a whole friggin' massive bag that they use on um, fields. It's the same stuff. We, we used to use like, when I worked for Bayer, we, when we did our field trial stuff, we would use like the bags, the giant chalk bags is what we would use on the fields. So that's what I would go with. Um, and then that, the level that you would put in there would depend on what your pH is. So go get a pH test kit. They're like $5 off Amazon. Basically you put a little bit of soil in, you add some drops, you fill with water, it changes color. Like the very inexpensive litmus test versions of these are the best. They're better than the probe versions. They're better than, you know, electronic versions, which can get a little bit complicated. So I would give the, the liquids with the drops a, a try there and it's gonna work really, really well for you and that will help you determine how much lime you need to add. And remember, someone asked me a question, I can't remember if it was on Instagram, they DM'd me, or if it was here on YouTube, but they had mentioned that they were looking at lime and there was um, almost like perlite versions of lime, like lime gravel, I guess. And then there was the powdered lime. They were asking which one was the better of the two. The powdered lime is always going to be your best bet. Remember, when I talk about soil, whether it's potting soil, which is soilless technically, or soil soil, I'm talking about a soil solution, meaning, if we were to take um, a tomato and we you know, put it in a stew or we are making tomato paste or sauce and then we grind it up, we have the seeds, we have the insides, and if we left the skins on, we have the skins. So we have three different components, but you would never know because they're in a solution at that point. And that's what we wanna do with the lime that we're adding. That's what we want to do when it comes to compost that we're adding and all that stuff. We want a homogenous solution. So then the plant roots are able to access it without having to um, steer their way to it, which they will do, or steer their way around it because it's too intense. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind there. Okay, so my husband just texted me. He's like, I'm watching your live stream. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. Okay, so my love, I'm gonna go to the um, 
the oh no 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 I have one more question okay so we have aqua run girl asking best tips for growing large lettuce heads do you need to use large containers and do term determinant cherry tomatoes necessarily die off after being harvested so when growing lettuce indoors yes you want to do the leafy lettuce head lettuce in particular um it needs really intense light if it gets a pest issue, it's much hard, more difficult to um, fix just because we have so many layers in there. And the other thing to think about is wind movement. So unless we have a really powerful fan inside of our grow tent or just around that plant in general, the, the leaves kind of building on themselves make it really difficult for um, air and stuff to pass through there. So we end up with mold, um, pest issues, that sort of thing. So I always say leafy lettuce. I just posted a reel yesterday about my lettuce. And so I'm doing like a loose leaf crinkle, which is, um, it's from West Coast Seeds. I can put the link to it specifically uh, on the comments like when we're done but the really nice thing about this lettuce is that I love crunchy head lettuce like me and my husband eat crunchy head lettuce like crazy romaine um, like chicken lettuce wraps that sort of thing like we love that sort of stuff so we to, to have the leafy lettuce that we don't really like just for salads it seems super inconvenient um, and not, you know, ideally what we would want. And so I'd be more likely to leave that in my grow tent and ignore it. Um, so what I'm doing, it's like a loose, it's a loose leaf, but it's like a uh, crinkled version. So it actually is pretty uh, dense and crunchy, but it allows you to harvest around the outside if you wanted to, or to cut the whole head out. Um, so it's really nice in between where I can get the airflow, get the light and can grow it indoors really, really nicely. Uh, for determinant cherry tomatoes, so the red robins, for example, when you harvest the cherries, um, the tomatoes, the plant may not necessarily die. So um, determinant we usually is, is defined as, if you guys are, who are watching don't know, determinant tomatoes mean that it has a life cycle of X number of days. It's going to flower, it's going to produce fruit, you're going to harvest the fruit, and then the proverbial plant is going to die. Indeterminate means that the plant does not have a determinate date in death. And so long as the conditions are ideal, the plant will continue to um, vine out and make leaves and do its thing. Now, the true definition of this, I guess you could say, loosely say, is that a determinate tomato is something that will continue to flower, bloom, and produce fruit so long as you have it in an ideal condition. So if you are continually harvesting the tomatoes and not letting them um, kind of rot, fall off, and tell the plant that its life cycle is done, the plant will continue to produce. Um, if you are keeping the conditions really nice, so proper humidity, proper lighting, um, in particular, the photo period of that plant. So if you are able to provide it the proper photo period, then the plant will be made in the shade, uh, all puns intended. <laughs> so I have a, a video coming out on lighting because you guys have just asked for this video so many times. I'm working on editing it um, today. I was editing humidity last night. Um, and so today I'm gonna work on my lighting video. If you guys didn't notice, I got a new camera, a new mic, and I completely changed the way I'm editing. And it's cause I went to YouTube school, literally went to YouTube school. <laughs> YouTube put me like through a three, six, or three, a six week course, uh, twice a week for three hours. And then they flew me out to Toronto for like a graduation after. Um, and in, in that they were telling me like how to edit and all that fun stuff. So I'm really doing quite a few changes. So um, bear with me on them. I'm human and I'm not perfect when it comes to this sort of stuff. You have to keep in mind anyone who is my friends and family literally are laughing inside when they uh, told them I was starting a YouTube channel or when they start seeing my YouTube channel. Because anyone who knows me knows I am the worst, guys. I'm the worst possible computer person ever. Like, put me in a forest and I will survive. Put me in a, a, a field somewhere, fishing, outdoors, like cooking, I'm good. I'll figure it out. That I can do. Hunting, you name it. Computers, electronics, absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. So it's been a huge learning curve um, with this channel. And I want to thank you guys so much for sticking it out because I know sometimes I've messed up on audio, I've messed up on music, I've messed up on like the cuts in the videos. Um, and you guys are so kind when you reach out, you're like, hey, just a heads up, you may have spelt this wrong. And I'm like, oh, shoot. So I'm like doing it in the washroom at work. <laughs> Just quickly like typing up the title or whatever the case is. So anyway, thanks for bearing with me on that because you guys don't know, I have a, unfortunately, I have a full-time job as well. So okay, yeah, I'm getting to the chat now. Let's take a look at what's on here. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. There's so many Merry Christmases. Merry, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Matt G, Ashley the Soul Scientist, live, so cool. I mean, I guess. I'm out of work technically right now. It's kind of cold outside. <laughs> I j that's a joke. That's a joke. All right. Get it all over my Garnet and Canada sweater. Actually, I miss my sweater. There, that's a selling feature. It is a uh, coffee escapee. Okay, so um, Matt says, are we looking into electroculture at all? Yeah, I mean, we could. Um, the only thing that I don't quite understand about it is so many people do it so many different ways. Um, and the Chinese seem to have it kind of set up the best way. The only thing that makes me nervous is so I have my um, two tomato beds. If you guys have been following this channel long enough, you know that I have my two tomato beds. One I run conventionally, one I run organically. Um, and I've been doing that now for years. And just to see what the difference between the two is. The problem is, is I don't really know where electroculture would hit, fall in this. So I don't know if electroculture would fall on um, organic or if it, I mean, it's definitely not conventional. But the problem I have is if I run it on my organic tomato bed, I would potentially run the risk of harming my microbiota in the soil. And, uh, and they say that it doesn't, but I would lean towards it doing exactly that. So I would need to set up a second or a third bed uh, that would just be an electroculture bag bed, um, which I would be interested in doing. I just got to figure out like what that would look like. And that may be something I need my husband's help on. Um, in the video, I did ask if anyone was running this to send me photos or um, an email over on Instagram or on email. Um, so if you have Instagram, it's Gardening in Canada. It's literally what it is. And then if you have email, it's just Ashley at gardeningincanada.net. It's literally that simple. Um, or you may be able to send it over the website. I'm not sure, gardeningcanada.net, if you go to the website, you may be able to send photos um, in the leave a comment or leave a chat. I'm not sure if it'll let you though, but I would like to see your guys' setup if you have any. Um, that's a very like intense, I guess you could say setup for sure, because it would involve batteries or yeah, it'd be intense, it'd be intense. Okay, on the east coast, uh, on the coast east side of Prince, William sound, not too cold, minus eight. David, David, oh my goodness gracious. You are uh, escaping all of it. Hands up, who's in Alberta and Saskatchewan? Hands up right now in the comment section because that, what we just came out of, that was cruelty. That was literal cruelty. It was when I went to work yesterday morning, it was a minus 38 without the wind. Minus 38 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Someone go quickly translate that on Google and pop it down in the question or down in the chat box. Minus 38. I think when I turned on the radio with the wind chill, they said it was like minus 46 or something stupid like that. No, absolutely not. The, your skin freezes. They say, oh, freezes in minutes. It freezes within seconds. I was, I had to walk from where we parked into the mall, which was kind of like down half a block and across the street. And I physically was feeling pain in my ears and my face. It was just, it's the weirdest, it's the weirdest sensation when it's that cold. 
Um, and I've been here my whole life, and that was that was excessive. That was so excessive. Uh, Brian's asking if I can recommend a, a book on soil microbiota morphology. Oh my goodness. Um, teeming with microbes is a good one. I have, do I have my university text? Uh, yes, I do. So I don't know how much this is going to be though, Brian, uh, biology of microorganisms. That is my soil book. Like from when I was in school, Woo. when I was from in university, let me just go grab it real quick. Oh, so this one's a textbook though. So, oh my God. Uh, this one's a textbook though. So I don't know if it's, um, this one's 12, this one's a 12th edition, but it's in super ratchet shape. These sheets are gonna like fall at the bottom. Um, Mendiga, Martinko, Dulap, and Clark. I would expect this to be expensive though, because this is my um, soil microbiology text. And you know, this book, it's not just soil. It does literally all different types of uh, microbiology in there. So it's actually, oh, that was, a, I like my microbiology class. It was actually kind of cool. Okay, so um, good morning from Montreal. Minus 20, unfortunately, without electricity last night. We'll not be on for a few days. We'll definitely watch the replay. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Oh my God, Aqua Girl. I answered your question earlier in this video. Um, hopefully you saw it before you had to shut off your phone because of power. That sucks. Minus 20, no power. What do you even do in that situation? Like, I guess I have a fireplace, but it's a natural gas and it, my natural gas will, will it run? I don't know. It's probably as a pump somewhere. See, I'd be screwed. I'd be screwed. I need to be taking more, um, more uh, tips from Nate. How does calcium nitrate break down in your soil? Um, Robert, are you applying calcium nitrate as a fertilizer or are you asking um, existing calcium nitrate how it breaks down in the soil? That would be my first question there. Um, otherwise, calcium nitrate, you, you'd have to, the bond structure is what would have to be damaged in that case. Now, with that being said, uh, and I, I really need to do a video on this, when you have a water and Saskatchewan, and I'm confident all the per, actually pro all of Canada, I'm just gonna say all of Canada, people are gonna correct me in the comments um, for the areas that I'm wrong, but most of Canada has very alkaline water. So we're above seven. We're about an, an eight um, across the board. So when we water with water, that is slightly alkaline, we end up actually changing our soil pH over time by depositing um, and forming calcium carbonate is what we're doing. So land that's irrigated, our garden, um, farms that are irrigated, they tend to become um, more alkaline soils over time, meaning majority of the time we're actually gonna be adding elemental sulfur to our garden before we're going to be adding lime. The same thing goes for the potting soil people. So houseplant people, container gardeners, indoor gardeners, you have alkaline water likely. And so when you do go to water, you will um, slowly be driving that pH up, which isn't a bad thing because potting soil is typically more acidic. So when it comes to those guys, we don't have to add anything because we are driving that pH upwards as we water over time. So the older our potting soil, um, theoretically, the better aligned it is pH wise for our, our plant uptake. But yeah, so that's something I need to do a video on because it's, um, it's a known fact that irrigation and that sort of thing does affect plants. So definitely something to think about there. Um, da -da -da -da. In pot with powdered eggshells, uh, sub for lime. Coastal crocus, wow, beautiful pick. Uh, advice for this, I have an avocado uh, plant tree outdoors the past summer, it's two feet tall now um, and indoors for winter. Feels like I'm. Go it's going to grow too tall to bring indoors after this next summer. That's cool, that's a problem, but that's cool. Um, have you tried topping it? So, 
I don't know, um, you'd have to send me like a photo of what it looks like, but typically if we top it, we can end up with a wying of the plant um, and, and that can make more of a bushier, stored or um, more stout plant. So this fiddly fig, which you hardly can see, you can like kind of see this plant, a leaf up there, it goes all the way up. So it goes da, 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 all the way up, but you can see there's two branches. So there's one that goes this way and there's one that goes straight up. It's cause it was cut or wide. Now, once it hits the roof here, I can cut it again and it will Y off of those two. So then I'll have four. And then you can cut again, cut again, cut again, and it will just make it like a bushier top. That's what I would do for your avocado tree, uh, rather than letting it just grow one single stem. It will work to your benefit, actually, because you'll end up with more potential avocado fruit if you do get it to fruit and flowers. So definitely something to think about there. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Jeff Bezos, how's it going? <laughs> you should get your some artichokes. They're uh, perennial potatoes. You know, I wish those grew here. That Saskatchewan, they just don't. They do not do well. They do not do well at all. My son is in Wyoming. It's minus 47 degrees. That's more like Canada. Looks like we sent you some of our weather. Ay, 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 ay. Uh, but I had a bad uh, problem with earwigs attacking my fruits and tent caterpillars in my apple trees. Oh no. What would you recommend as conventional or organic um, options for pest management? Oh man, that's unfortunate. The tent caterpillars in particular. Um, you know, I would look into, I don't know what this orchard um, or this apple tree situation looks like, like how far it is away from electricity and stuff. Or if you could even get, um, like a canistered version of this, but sulfur, um, and copper are the two things that I would try to apply full year application. The sulfur would be more of a fog. And so you could hang a dish, um, put electricity through it. It'll heat the sulfur puck and kind of let the smoke come out. Um, and that actually would likely help you quite a bit there. The, the copper you could also spray on um, as a foliar application and that would help too. Those are the two things that I would most definitely try in this case. Other than that, find natural predators you can source locally and uh, purchase those. So whether it would be ladybugs or um, you know a different form of caterpillar, like I'm not familiar with what the um, predators of these are right off the top of my head, but you could, there's lots of biological uh, pest companies out there that you could contact and ask them, um, what is a, a battleship against this problem that you're having. 32 degrees Celsius and sunny in Northern Australia, chef's circle. We have a lot of people in the comments that are up for adoption. If you want to come grab one of us, that'd be great. That'd be great. Matt G, my daughter was bored in minus 55 Celsius three winters ago. Sorry, he's low ice. Little ice cube baby. Ice cube baby. Um, Earwigs, what a name. <laughs> Merry Christmas from Everything Plants, that's Jeff. My wind chill is minus 30, I can't imagine it being colder than that. Yes, my red ramen tomato was produced fruit in September through October and they are now producing again. Yeah. Bev's right. They, it's just this thing. I don't know why we started the, the rumor that determinant means flower fruit done. If you're maintaining the plant, it's going to continue to fruit and flower. Um, I mean, and when we're talking about plants, it would feel indefinitely, um, in that case. So Hi from the UK, it's eight degrees Celsius here at the moment. UK, it's crazy. It's crazy because I see uh, gardeners in the UK and I always think to myself, your climate has to be m more mild than Canada's. And you think, well, no, it's, it's gotta be, it's cold, right? Like it always looks cold and dreary on the, like the 
video footage or the photo footage you see. No, it's actually a mild, moderate climate in the UK. And that's how they grow so many dang fruits and vegetables. That's why their gardens look so top notch. They look better than all the Californians gardens. They look better than all the Canadian gardens. And it's because they literally, they literally have the perfect climate. And even funnier than that, and I should do a video on this maybe. So the UK is where all our garden knowledge has come from. So how we garden, the way we garden, what we plant, how we grow it, all that stuff is completely based on Europeans, like on the UK and what they're doing over there. Just a fun fact. So when you think of your ornamentals you grow, your vegetables you grow, you name it, it's all based on what they've done. It's just, it, the history of it is so interesting and it's so heavily influenced um, by the UK. And so it'd be just neat if someone just took that by the horns I mean, it's like a Canadian or like an American, um, you know, region specific version of gardening. Um, because there's, I mean, there are perennial plants that aren't considered perennial plants that grow in zone three, for example, which is my zone. It's a very cold zone that are edible. You just would have to figure out where to plant them, how to plant them, and what the heck to cook with them, um, how to cook with them. So one really great example of this is Loveridge. So uh, classically, we grow celery. Celery we use in mirepoix. We use them um, to, you know, our turkey that we're probably going to eat either tonight or tomorrow night for our stuffing, that sort of thing. We always use celery. Well, Loveridge is the equivalent of celery. It's like it maybe a little bit more mild tasting, but it's a huge plant. It, it grows in Canada and it's a huge plant. Like you struggle with star celery here. It's, I mean, it's wonderful to grow. I grow it, but you struggle with it here. Loveridge. Look up Google Loveridge and it will blow your mind, A, the size of this thing, and B, the fact that it is celery. That is what it is, celery. And I think the leaves actually may have more medicinal properties than celery if they're used in a tea. Just a fun fact, don't shoot the messenger. I'm trying to find a plant, a leverage plant. But again, it's like one of those things that isn't Canadianized yet. So it just doesn't, you don't have access to it. Sometimes you can find people with it in their, in their yards. Um, my lovely neighbors from next town stopped over um, today to look at my generator and teach me how to use it. I bought from the elders who left me all their stuff. Oh, that's really cool to have a generator. That's really, really cool. Um, I love my new rural life. I have 15 people that check on me. Yeah, rural life is very different. Um, when I was in Toronto, this is so funny, and hands up in the comments if you guys are from a different, like if you're from a big city, a small city, a town, or rural. I'd, I'd love to know this. So I was in Toronto and um, I guess I was laughing. I was like, you don't, you don't send the country bumpkin, like the little redneck, you do not send them to Toronto and not expect anarchy. So I get to Toronto and it's just very normal in Saskatoon um, and at the farm, like in Blaine Lake where we are, if you're in the grocery store lineup or if you're walking through somewhere and um, you make eye contact with someone or you just bump into someone, it's not abnormal to spark up a conversation with them to say like, Hey, how's it going? Like, Oh my God, this weather, or, um, why are there not enough cashiers open? And you know, how was your, what are you doing for the rest of the night? Strangers, like absolute strangers. You will, you will pop up this kind of conversation with them. So I'm in Toronto and I'm like, just acting myself. Like I'll be in lineup and I'll be like, yeah, you know, a few hours left in the night. Like, what do you, what's your plans for the rest of the night? And people were in Toronto were shocked absolutely shocked that I was even talking to them. A, B, if you smile at someone in Toronto, they immediately will like dead eye you back, no smile, no nothing, and then like right away look at their phone again. And I don't know if they were put off by me, just being friendly, but it was so freaking bizarre. We're walking through the in Eaton Center, we're going down the escalator and there's two other YouTubers that I was with, um, Jessica and Lauren, Laura. Um, one does like a history, a YouTube channel and the other one just like a finance community finance uh, YouTube channel so we're on the escalator we're going to the Eaton Center and I was like the people coming the other way I was like smile be happy and they were just they weren't having it so um, definitely a major difference between t between people groups of people anyways so um 
da, da, da. Oh my goodness, there's so many flavor, not mild, super. <laughs> Leverage is an insane. So Matt says, uh, very flavor, not mild, super celery. I found it mild. Baby, okay, maybe I didn't harvest it. I harvested it too early in the year. So the flavor profile didn't fully develop. Maybe you ate yours later in the year. Maybe that's what it was. Um, anyway. Oh, Tracy's like, oh, I caught the lag. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, da, 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 da. Small rural city, Gibb says, 13 to 14,000. Yeah, that's, that's really nice. City in Northern California. Rumham says, yeah, but Toronto sucks. <laughs> Keys, I would totally be going to the aquarium, the Ripley's Aquarium. That was actually really cool. That was really cool. And someone else on the community tab, when I asked you guys what to do, someone commented, um, what was it? It was uh, Royal Ontario Museum. I went there. That was cool. Very cool, actually. The fourth floor. The floor, the fourth floor, A plus plus, A plus plus. Um, and then the, what was it? Christmas Village? It was Old Distillery Market. I can't remember. I went there, um, I don't know, I'm not like a shopping, I'm not a shopping person, it's super weird. Um, even when I was in the Eaton Center, I literally knew what I wanted, got what I wanted, and then walked back out. Like, that's the shopping style I am. Even yesterday when I was shopping, it's like, bam, 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 done. Um, I don't really, yeah, I'm not, I'm not huge on shopping. So that part was kind of like, eh, but it was pretty. It was so gorgeous, so beautiful. And then I went for a tapas, Spanish tapas restaurant. It's like, if you go in the Christmas market, you walk all the way to the back and it's on the right-hand side. Yeah, right-hand side. It's, uh, was it a Spanish tapas? that I'm a foodie. I am a major foodie and I'm a major foodie for like different types of cuisines. Spanish tapas by myself, beautiful espresso cocktail, a book. It was wonderful. I ordered, I think four or five different, uh, tap cause if you guys didn't know tapas are like these little tiny mini meals and you order like a whole bunch of them and they bring them all up. Oh, it was, it was Wonderful. I highly recommend that restaurant. If I knew the name of it, I won't tell you what it is, but I cannot remember what it is. Um, Southeast Michigan at zero degrees. I think my garlic is frozen. No, it's not. It's not. Your garlic was going to be totally fine. If I'm, if I'm confident my garlic is going to be okay, your garlic is going to be A++. I would have probably have to replant some of it, but I, I'm pretty confident. Um, confident today. Have you ever had uh, orange banana peppers? Like grown them? I've never grown bananas. I've done Hungarian hot wax, which aren't hot by the way. Tell, tastes like bell peppers. I've done bell peppers. I've done jalapenos. I've done chili. I've done habanero. And I've done, what were those ones I did last year? They're like tiny little they look like grapes almost. Those ones were very good. Very, very, very t tasty. Marty says, good morning. Good morning. Oh, Matt, you have lover seeds. Well, I may need to grab some from you. My soil is very acidic. Is there any way I can raise the peach in my orchid? Yeah. Yeah. You can use elemental salt or, um, don't use elemental salt for that, but in the opposite direction. Uh, lime, lime, uh, dolomite lime. You can buy like tiny little bags of it. From Amazon, you could go to like any sort of garden center will have that. Lime, 100% lime. Um, works really, really, really good. Top pass, top pass. It's pronounced top as, top as. See, this is Canadian. Actually, it was so funny. Um, when was that? It was like last week sometime and someone commented, they must be new to the channel or they maybe don't know Canadians, but um, they're like, you need to stop swinging your sentences up at the end. It always sounds like you're asking a question. Yes, I know, 
I'm Canadian. I cannot stop it. It's it's what we do. It's my accent. If I could change it, I would, but I can't. It's and I know it irritates people. When I'm editing, when I'm editing my videos, it irritates me. Cuz I'll edit something and I'll finish the sentence and I'll cut it off and I'm like, I it sounds like I just asked a question and I didn't ask a question. I'm just speaking, but it's my accent. It's the I can't stop it. I've tried to stop it. I can't stop it. And in particular, anyone with an accent knows this. When you get excited about something and I'm obviously excited about soil plants, etc. and so forth, gardening, you name it. So when you get excited and passionate about something, your accent gets worse. So, it's just deal with it. I can't fix it. It is what it is. It is what it is. Francis, you made it. I think this is like your third one in a row, bud. Third one in a row. That sounded very Canadian. I was given banana peppers and I like them to go probably too long, but they turn orange and they were very, very sweet and delicious. Yeah. You know, I like to le let mine go quite long too. Um, I jalapenos as well. If you let a jalapeno sit long enough, they will turn red. Anyways, it just, the flavor profile changes. Um, the, the texture in some cases can change. They become a little bit more firm in a lot of cases. So I like to experiment with leaving peppers on longer or shorter or uh, anything of that nature. We do a Canadian in, uh, accent in Minnesota too. Yes, you do. You do a Canadian accent in Minnesota. Um, my friend dated someone from there. And he came over and I was expecting, this was so many years ago, I was expecting him to walk in and to, for him to be American, like to sound American. And that's another thing. People in Toronto, they sound so American. It's not even funny. Their mannerisms, the way they talk, everything. It's like, it's American. It's the most bizarre thing ever. But um, this guy from Minnesota walks in the house and I like went up to him and I'm like, hi, my name's Ashley. Uh, and he spoke and... Besides not saying A, that he says bud, he says yeah, you know, yeah. Like it, we do that, yeah, no means no. Um, no, yeah means yeah. Like that's just how we speak. So when he walked in, it was it was a Canadian accent. It was so, it was hardcore Canadian accent too. Like it sounded similar to what my father-in-law sounds like. like boondocks saskatchewan canadian accent it was just the craziest thing ever so super bad merry christmas from britain holy mother i like all accents except valley girl what's valley girl i don't even know what that is i have to youtube that after i have to youtube that after francis are you from saskatchewan too no francis is from the uh, maritimes the Maritimes is where Francis is from. Oh, hi, yeah, how are you? Oh, oh hi, yeah, hey, how are you? Minnesotans. Yeah, that's true. That's true. My, my one cousin has like the rankest Canadian accent ever. He sounds like he's off of like the red, oh, you Americans probably don't know what this is, the Red Green Show. If you guys have watched that, that's what my, my cousin sounds like. It's hilarious. Small town, 500 people, Wisconsin. How long does it take for hydro lettuce from your reels? Oh, um, my lettuce is 30 to 60 days. That's it. One to two months. And that's like one to two months. If you chose not to harvest, you could harvest continually starting at about 30 days. Um, but I like heads of lettuce. So I, I wait like this. It's about 45 ish days. Um, for those to come through the, the more, the more, uh, and I, I gotta do a video on this, but the more wind movement you have in the form of fans or in the form of, um, just exhaust, even if you have an exhaust fan, anything like that, um, on the plant, the faster the plant is going to grow now and, and within reason, within reason. But the reason for that is because as the air moves across the, the plant, the stomata on the bottom of the leaves the water will get pulled out and then the roots are signaled we need more water and more nutrients so it gets brought into the plant faster water leaves quicker and so um, photosynthesis is more efficient now not on a tropical plant tropical plants are quite honestly the opposite but in lettuce for example this would apply 
Um, so the more rapid growth we get. So the more water we have moving through, the more nutrients taken up, the more CO2 let in for the longer the stomata are open, the more photosynthesis takes place, the more carbohydrate we get, the more carbohydrate and glucose we get, the more <laughs> leaves we get. And so that's how you expedite growth um, very quickly. The other thing to think about is photo period. If your photo period is dialed in for lettuce, then you are going to get more rapid growth um, from that as well. So yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on cross competition with the float system from the poo? Uh, oh, Emily's asking about um, Emily's asking about the one in the basement. Um, no, because it's not the poo that is in direct contact with the plant in aquaponics system. The poo technically is being decomposed and um, chemically altered, for lack of a better term, into bioavailable nutrients for uptake. So it's first deposited, it turns into ammonium. Ammonium turns into nitrite, nitrate, and then that is what is uptaken by the plant. So I'm not worried about um, like E. coli or anything like that. I would never do like an aquaponic system where I'm dumping like chicken poo and you want it specifically to be fish poo in that case. But yeah, I, I don't have any um, concerns about that one at all. The red green show is funny. I know it's hilarious. It's so funny. It's so good. Um, if they don't want you handsome, they should at least find you handy. Yeah, red green show. The red green show. Oh, that's so funny. That's too good. Merry Christmas, people. Merry Christmas, Brian. Uh, red green. We used to love that. Yeah, see, everyone knows red green. It's such a good one. My audience, by the way, you guys are older, like older as in like my age. Um, but I have an older audience compared to a lot of YouTube. So us, like us, the Guardian Canada crew, we are... 30, 25, maybe, maybe 25. Comment down below if you're in your 20s. It's very unlikely. But 30 to 65 is kind of like the bulk of us. Anyways, it's funny because we're older so we can laugh about red and green, but most YouTube channels would have no idea what red and green is. So it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. Uh... Amer, uh, hey, Merry Christmas. I watched your mycorrhizae series. I loved it. You mentioned how uh, able, how mycorrhizae is heat sensitive, but what's your take on them surviving in countries near the equator? Oh, soil. Okay, so now that video is very old, and I feel like I need to do an updated video on that. Yes, mycorrhizae, um, the spores, they're fungal spores. So they're pretty, they're pretty good, pretty good at withstanding temperature. The problem becomes when we have too much humidity combined with high temperatures. And when I talk about high temperatures, I'm talking about it's sitting in the front of a shop with direct sunlight on it. That's what I was talking about in that video. Equator soils, black soils, container gardens, to a point, depending on where they're placed. These ones I'm not worried about because soil itself usually is a much cooler than the world around it. So soil is able to be a heat sink or a temperature sink essentially. So when our, our soil is um, warming up in the spring, it may be thawed and we're thinking, oh, it's warm, I can plant. But if you got a temperature gauge, and that's what I use, I use a temperature gauge for um, determining when to transplant and when to seed outdoors. If you put the temperature gauge in, even that first inch or two, you'd be shocked, absolutely shocked by the temperature of that soil compared to the ambient temperature. So end of May, beginning of June, zone three, you pop that probe in there, it's gonna be about five degrees Celsius. It's cold still inside the soil. And so because of that, you, you need to determine when to actually sow your seeds and fungi and bacteria and microbes like those cooler environments. So they tend to do very well in that case. Now the top inch or two of soil, as the summer goes on, begins to get warmer and warmer. But that doesn't mean below that level that it's not a healthy, vibrant microbiota. And what you need to keep in mind is that fungi in particular 
is the, you know, one of the microbes that don't necessarily, like, they need oxygen, but they don't need as intense of oxygen as some of the macrobiota that you would find would need in the top surfaces of the soil. So I'm not worried about um, using mycorrhizae in soil near the equator. It's going to work just fine. Sandy soil tends to just do poor with mycorrhizae. Um, and that's for, for a number of different reasons, none of which have to do with heat. So, you know, keep that in mind, um, for sure, for sure. I bought a property a year and a half ago, super dense, hard pan, six inch deep, bunch of one inch rocks. Are the rocks contributing to the compaction? Should I be sifting them out of my garden beds? Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, no, they're not, they're not contributing to compaction. The only time a rock, um, the only time rocks would contribute to compaction would be if the rocks were placed on top of the soil when the soil was wet. So if you are uh, moving across soil in the spring or in the fall or after a fresh rainfall or after you water your plants, you walk across it, you are smooshing your pore space. And the same thing would go if you were to add rocks at that time. What I will say is rocks are difficult for plant roots to navigate through, or um, and so they have to navigate around them, which can obviously cause its own issues. And because of that, the space around the rock, um, and obviously the space that the rock is occupying, will never have pore space or porosity in the soil, which means it will never have air, which means it will never have oxygen, which will mean microbes will not colonize as well in those areas, which means you will just have um, generally poor soil structure. So if you wanted to, you could remove the rocks, but I am not particularly concerned with one inch rocks as much as I would be with um, something maybe larger in size. In size. Now I want to, um, the super hard pan at six inches deep, that makes me think it's uh, a clay. So you have like some sort of like a gravel sand, um, maybe like a sandy loam texture on top. And then you have like a clay below that, meaning that top layer likely was deposited after the fact at some point, whether it was blown in which is, you know, something I'd lean more towards, or if it was brought in physically by somebody. Below that, to have a six inch clay seam, um, that, or a hard pan, because that's really the only thing that can cause a hard pan is lots and lots of clay. That sounds like that's like a natural deposit. So what I would do is I would dig through that and I would see if there's any coloration in there. So is there gray, is there um, like a red in there? And if there is, that may mean that you have some standing water in, the, in those spaces. And that may be something that you may want to investigate looking at drainage and that sort of thing. So that's what I would do and um, take into consideration. If, when you say beds, Tracy, like, do you mean raised beds or are you just talking ground beds? Because that, um, it would be weird for that to be in a raised bed, if you, if you know what I mean, so. Um, da, da, da. Yeah, 32, 33, I'm always forgetting, 37, 33, 34. See, I knew it, we're old, we're old. <laughs> We're old. Oh, except for Francis. Francis says he's fresh out of the oven. He's like a little biba. <laughs> Francis. David, 72. Norma, 74. See, we're, I knew that. I knew that. I know that because I watch my analytics and I'm like, it's old people. It's us. It's us people that don't like the flashy stuff and all the music and all that sort of, I was, when I was doing my YouTube training, I was saying that I was, people were comparing like their profiles of who watches their channel and that sort of thing. Cause we can, we can see all that on our end. And I was like, guys, I have old, like I have myself. I was one of the older people in the group and myself. I have like my parents, I have like my grandparents <laughs> watching this stuff, like flashes and bangs and like loud noises and like fast pop-ups. Like, no, people aren't, we're not going to like that. It's not, we're going for more of like a Martha Stewart type vibe here is what we're doing. So. Da, 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 da. Your hair is on point today, Francis. Oh, okay. So it's so funny. 
Um, my husband, he just like popped into the live stream and he's like, oh, you look so pretty today. I was like, thanks. Cause he left for work. I feel so bad for the guy. He works for, um, maybe I shouldn't say, he works for a train company. Anyway, so he has to go drive a train. Um, but when you drive a train, you're actually like walking rails and you're doing quite a bit of work outside. And so he's had to work the last like four days. And like, we're talking the last four days when it's been like minus a bajillion. I feel so bad for him. So bad. 51, 62, 39. Oh, 39 tomorrow. Prairie River Homestead. Hey, happy birthday. Everybody say happy birthday in the comments. Say happy birthday on the comments. Martha Stewart, right? Slope gravel with a yellowish compared to the upper layer. layer. It's sloped above ground level. Color is yellowish compared to the upper layer. Okay, it's like a sandy. Um, what I would do, Tracy, then, is I would actually add in uh, like a compost or manure into that and really dig it in good. It sounds like you're really lacking a lot of organic material, which will um, uh, co compact the issue and make it worse. How do you worry about microbiology in containers specifically? Should I do something to establish microbe life when putting together medium in my pots? Um, Terry, it's going to really depend on if you're choosing to do organic um, fertilizer or not. If you're not choosing to do organic fertilizer and you want to go just conventional, I actually wouldn't worry about it too, too much. Um, however, if you want organic, you really do need a good microbe system. So I would start with a... Uh, a microbe, what would you call that? Um, the inoculants, but not just any inoculant. I want you to get something that has mycorrhizae, rhizobacterium, um, if it has phosphate solubilizing bacteria, even better, you name it, um, in that container. There's one, it's called White Shark, and I've been working on something on my blog side, like on the website, gardeningcanada.net, and I've been working on comparing all the different forms of mycorrhizal products to see which one has the largest number of species and that white shark has the most the absolute has the most so um that would be something to think about also you need to feed them food so you need to provide compost and manures all of which are cured properly uh 25 percent to the remainder of potting soil and yeah that's what i would go with there so oh tracy thank you merry christmas let me know how it goes. Send me um, like photos over on Ashley at gardeningcanada.net. And yeah, <laughs> I remain anonymous. Actually, I think she's getting prettier with every video. Oh, that's so kind. That's so kind. I have raised beds no till that are on their second year. What is your opinion on using a broad fork? Love it. Absolutely love the broad fork. Love the broad fork love uh, pitchforks, anything like that, A++. If you are not using a broad fork, if you are not using a broad fork and you are also not tilling, you are going to have much, much lower yields than you would if you just used a broad fork. And if you guys don't know what what uh, Naoma, Naomi, Naomi is talking about, you need to go check out the video that I did on this. It's yes, yes, 100% yes. Um, Norma is wishing Prairie River Homestead happy birthday. Great White, Great White Shark. I'm pretty sure it's called Great White Shark, uh, run boy. Lisa, 16, San Diego. You're just a kid. <laughs> 26 degrees Celsius for Xmas. Wow, that would that'd be nice, that would be nice. I love using a broad fork, so energy efficient. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's an awesome, awesome product, so. But I gotta wrap Christmas gifts still, clean my house, and uh, yeah, my grandma's birthday is tonight, so happy birthday, grandma. I know she's not watching this, but um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta skedaddle here, guys. So Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Who can afford a broad fork? I have to do a video on this. Using a fork, like a pitchfork, is cheaper than using a shovel. Or, well, not cheaper, but it's a better tool. It's a better tool. Debate me on it. Debate me on it. I think it's a better uh, better tool. Runboy, fungus nets, 
killing home remedies. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis or nematodes. Those are the two things that I use personally that I think work very, very nicely. Um, but yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Fran says, I've become such a better gardener because of this channel this year. Thank you so much. Yeah, so hopefully you have a good year again. And if you guys did not hear, the posting schedule for the winter, I will tell you when the schedule changes. The schedule for the winter is Tuesdays and Fridays, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, and then Sundays at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time. So mark those in your phone so you're here for them live. There is a new bill coming out for Canada. It's called Bill C C11, I think, or something like that. Uh, essentially, it's going to put my channel, potentially all Canadian channels, under like the rules of the CRTC. YouTube is trying to tell us to fight this. They're concerned that it's going to harm our channels and that you guys aren't going to see the, the footage uh, that I put out, which is slightly concerning. So if that happens, those are the dates and times I am posting for the winter months. I will let you know when that changes for the summer. What I will say is if you want to keep in touch, sign up for my newsletter. It's in the descriptions of a majority of my videos. So go check that out. Click on the newsletter and sign up or go to gardeningincanada.net. You can go to the website and it will have a bar at the top that says join newsletter. Click that, fill it in. I do not spam you. I think I've sent out one newsletter in two years. It's not my thing, but it will allow me to get hold of you just in case something crazy happens with the algorithm, uh, which fingers crossed it doesn't happen. I hope this bill just gets thrown out. Um, anyways, who, who knows? Who knows? What I'm not getting into politics during Christmas unless I'm a couple drinks deep. <laughs>